Good evening or good afternoon. May I have your attention? Can we get started? My name is Robert Mounts. I'm, on, I'm the current year president of the Matheson History Museum and welcoming all of you here. It's a great crowd uh, celebrating a wonderful book of essays uh, written by a very dear friend of mine, uh, David Colburn, who I knew from church and uh, shared a few stories with because I used to work way back when I was a young lawyer for a couple of years for Ruben Askew, who was someone he was very close to, especially as a historian. I got to tell him some things that he didn't know, uh, but that was too late for his book. But uh, the medium of the op-ed, uh, the opposition, the uh, editorial opinion piece like this, 700 words, 750 words, is something you may know I like to do myself now and then. And uh, I find it particularly the, just the right length, you know, to get across a cogent message, to make three good points in support of it, and then to stop. I don't tweet. <laughs> How many of you tweet? You know, I don't tweet. That's, that's just too anti-intellectual, don't you think? So, and the other thing is that uh, Senator Bob Graham is the last, I hopefully, hopefully not the last, great Democratic governor and senator uh, following a long line, Leroy Collins, uh, Ruben Askew, Lawton Childs, people that I grew up admiring and uh, all of my life. And boy, do we need them now, don't we? <laughs> so my job is very simple though, on behalf of the Matheson History Museum, which is the Alachua County's History Museum, your museum, I just want you to know that we depend here solely on donations and grants. Uh, two agencies supporting this program tonight are Visit Gainesville and Florida Humanities. We appreciate that support. Uh, the amazing give, which you, some of you may know about is, it, yeah, it ended yesterday, but they accept donations through tomorrow. And we're raising money to uh, keep these grounds beautiful uh, with a new landscaping contract, and we still need a little bit more to get our goal for that for the year. So if you are of a mind to, and you like what you see here at the Matheson, and I know you will today, you know, don't forget, you can still go to our website, mathesonmuseum.org and donate through the amazing give or at any time. And, and by the way, one silver lining of COVID is that when our museum was closed, we put a lot of stuff up online, you know, on YouTube and on our website. This, this program is being live streamed uh, and many of our programs are already up on YouTube. You can go back and see them. Uh, we didn't used to do that. So silver lining of COVID. And um, my last job, aside from recognizing Governor Graham's wife, Adele, and his daughter, Sissy, who are here with us, and Marion Colburn, my dear friend of David's wife. Uh, I'd like to introduce Matt Jacobs, who replaced David Colburn as director of the Graham Center. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I think replaced is probably a bit too heavy of a word. Uh, I, I'm happy with followed. I don't like replaced because I don't think David was replaceable in that context. So, but I appreciate the kind words. Uh, today's a good day. It's a good day to see all of you here. It's a good day to finally be able to do an event like this. And it's a good day to celebrate the life work of two individuals, uh, David Colburn and Senator and Governor Bob Graham. And so it's really wonderful to see all of you here for this occasion. I, I wanna start also by acknowledging Mrs. Graham, Sissy and Marion Colburn. It's great to have you here. Unfortunately, Bob is not, be, not able to be here today. I will say that I believe he is watching and I think that he will enjoy today's event. I also would like to recognize one other, one other individual who can, unfortunately cannot be here today and that's Chris Hand. Chris Hand was a, is and has been a longtime collaborator of Governor and Senator Graham. And his uh, voice comes through in many of the op-eds as well because he's been a contributor and collaborator on many of them. Unfortunately, he's at a memorial service today for a friend and teacher of his where he's delivering the eulogy. Otherwise, he would be here today. 
Uh, so I do want to acknowledge his contributions uh, and his meaning and value, not just to the book that, that we're here to talk about, but also to the Graham family. And so, Chris, sorry you can't be here. I hope you're able to watch this at some point. I will say this event will, is being recorded. It will be posted uh, on the Graham Center website and on the Matheson Museum website. So you'll be able to view this uh, later if you wish. If you want to go back and see the highlights, you, you'll, be, you'll be free to. I can't guarantee there will be ESPN's top 10, but hopefully it'll be uh, entertaining to, to rewatch. Um, before I introduce our actual uh, speaker today, I want to take a couple of minutes to just comment a little bit on the book and leadership, uh, because the book captures the work of two great leaders of our state, one elected, one intellectual. Uh, the, the elected leader served in the state house for many years, served as our governor, served as our senator for a long time. Indeed has a career and a life of public service and leadership. And that life and career of leadership is really vital for us to, to acknowledge because one of the things about Governor and Senator Graham is that he really did believe not just in writing for the public good, but in leading and serving for the public good as a leader and servant of our state and of our country. And if you wanna think about that, think about a couple of the moments when he was leading and serving, moments of crisis. And if you think about during his governorship, think about the Mariel Boatlift, think about the collapse of the, the Skyway Bridge in Tampa, think about any number of issues that he had to lead our state through. Think about the growth of the state of Florida. And one of the things that comes out in this book is the fact that Florida really faces a challenge that is quite unique that is that most of the residents of Florida aren't actually from Florida when you actually think about it over the long term. And what does that mean when you're trying to create an identity for a state, when you're trying to lead a state and build a sense of community and lead for the public good? If you're going to be successful at that, you have to lead for all of the public, not the public for whom you choose, right? You have to lead for everyone in the state. And certainly as governor and as senator, Bob Graham has done so. I also want to call your attention to another event. When 9-11 happened, he was chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee. So at a moment such as that, partisanship had no place, right? He had to lead through his position for our country in terms of evaluating intelligence, leading the, the Joint Commission to investigate 9-11. And then again, jumping forward, even after he was no longer an elected official, serving on the, the BP uh, Horizon Oil Hill Commission as well. Some critical moments in our state where again, leading to serve and leading for the public good was really critical. And then David Colburn, an intellect uh, unparalleled, I would say, especially when we start thinking about the politics of our state of Florida and someone who also believed in leading and serving for the public good. And that began with his service in Vietnam. And it continued as a professor here, and it continued as an administrator here, but perhaps most importantly, it continued as somebody who is deeply concerned about the public good. And for him, think no, uh, no further than his role on the commission to investigate Rosewood, one of the most horrible, horrible and horrific events in our state's history. He didn't believe you could shy away from that, that you had to face it squarely, that you had to account for it, right? And he led our state in doing that. And so those are just a couple of examples of what leadership and service for the public good really means, right? Today, we're gonna to be talking about writing for the public good. And one of the things that, that I think that you'll gain from this is seeing through their writing, how that principle of for the public good, no matter the issue, carried forward. And to lead us through that today, we have Steve Knoll. So Steve Knoll uh, is professor or er, lecturer, master lecturer in the Department of History, where he's been for several decades. He's an accomplished teacher, award-winning teacher, and also a gifted scholar in his own right. When David passed away uh, in September of 2019, he and uh, Governor Graham had been already working on this book. And one of the things that we all committed to was bringing this book to fruition. And Adele and Marion asked me who I thought would be appropriate to, to help uh, work on that. And I could think of no one better than Steve Knoll. He teaches Florida history. He writes about Florida history. He lives Florida history. Uh, and if you don't believe that, ask his students. So it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Knoll to, to walk us through what, what it's meant to him to work on the book and the process and, and the content of the book. Steve, thank you. Thanks. 
and my students are here, so you can ask them. So, um, um, and again, it's, it's a, a testament to them that they did come here and they'll be helping. So um, thank you. Please turn your cell phones off. Um, my students know the only phone that's allowed to ring during my lectures is mine uh, because they know it's probably either the roofers or the plumbers who are a constant presence in my life and the life of my wife as well. Um, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here this afternoon. Many of you know who know me have never seen me in a tie, right? Um, I'm wearing one today to commemorate the real authors of this book, uh, Dr. David Kahlberg and Senator Governor Bob Graham, who could not be here today. Um, what an honor for me to share this book with these two great Floridians. And if you look closely, you'll see that I'm wearing this Florida tie, which fits nice only, not only nicely with the cover of the book, which is just fantastic, um, and it'll look great on your bookshelf, um, uh, but it ties in with uh, the cookies that my wife has made, which I hopefully you will um, partake in after the event is over. There's going to be a reception out in the back. Yes, King. So please come and enjoy her cookies and um, the delicious food that we have for you guys. And there's beer and wine too. So um, you'll probably need it after this talk. Um, um, so, um, finally not it's nice it's very nice to finally speak to an audience in person as the world opens up after two years of just zooming but welcome also to those people who are zooming here uh through the ether i'd like to take this opportunity to um thank lots of folks for making this talk possible first caitlin Ka uh, caitlin hoff mahoney and the staff of the matheson museum for providing this wonderful venue and um hopefully you guys have seen the exhibit on black thursday in the other room which also was curated by my former student which is just wonderful. Um, Alana Gomez, who's not here today, hopefully she's in the ether as well. Um, and a shout out to uh, Patricia Putman and the folks from Florida Humanities for co-sponsoring uh, this event and for being such a huge supporter of myself and David and Governor Graham over the years. And the executive director who was here, he is here, okay. Um, Dr. Nasheed Median, who is here all the way from St. Pete. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate you being here and your support of all the things Florida that, that you guys do. Um, to the Bob Graham Center for Public Service at UF and the people there, Matt, who you just heard, um, Associate Director Marianne Vernetson and Communications Director Dorothy Zimmerman, who are here. They work with us uh, assiduously to get this book out and to get this event um, on, the, on the table. Um, to the folks at University Press of Florida, um, direct, former Director Meredith Babb and current Director Romy Gutierrez, who believed in this project from the beginning. God, I sound like a, I'm winning an Oscar here. It's crazy. Um, 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 and, and if I'm going on too long, I'll. Uh, Maybe Will Smith can come up and slap me, right? Um, um, a big shout out to Michelle Fayek Berkeley, who shepherded the book, this book all the way through this process. Um, they managed to get the book out and look so amazing through this pandemic. But finally, to my wife, Beverly, for all the time um, you put into this and for your great cookies and just uh, supporting, and especially to the families of David and Bob, who welcomed me into their lives and made me feel as much a part of this book as David and Bob. I was honored in the fall of 2019 when David Coleman's wife, Marion, asked me to bring this collection of op-ed pieces to publication. David had un just untimely passed away and I felt there's no better way to honor my good friend and mentor than by getting his and Governor Graham's newspaper pieces out in book form. I had known David for almost 40 years, first as a graduate advisor, then as a mentor, then as a close friend. But my best associations with David were on the basketball court. As, as every Friday, history faculty and graduate students would meet at some UF courts near Archer Road, now bulldozed over for Shan's expansion to both shoot hoops and shoot the shit. Um, from this interaction, David became someone who could say things to me that no one else could. And he always called me Noel. And in his inimicable uh, New England accent, Noel, when are you going to get a haircut? So I did, David. But like I, but like I always tell him, David, unlike tattoos, which are there permanently, my hair can grow back. Um, whenever I went over to the Graham Center, where he, when he was a director, our conversation would always end with his director. No, you need to write a good biography of Bob Graham. There hasn't been one, but you can do it. I always demurred as my plate was full with other responsibilities. Well, David, I finally wrote the book, not as a conventional biography of Governor Graham, but as an edited volume of his words, combined with your words, um, told through the op your op-ed pieces, demonstrating your clarity, vision, and wisdom, the wisdom of both of you. 
I met Governor Graham in a very different way than I met David Colburn. And you know, I have a problem with names, right? I don't know what to call people. So, you know, what do I call him? I certainly didn't want to call him Bob, you know. Um, Governor Graham, Senator Graham, but as a Floridian, I want to call him Governor Graham. So I will call him Governor Graham throughout the this this um, discussion. I got to know him before I actually met him in person when Ann Henderson was the director of the Graham Center. Under her, her auspices and that of Carl Van Ness, um, UF archivist and uh, university historian who is retiring um, this year, good for him. I spent a summer in Smathers Library organizing and categorizing boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of his papers in anticipation of their transfer from his home in Miami Lakes to the archives at UF Special Collections. You get to know someone very well by examining their papers. And in between the vast numbers of plane tickets, boarding passes, restaurant rest receipts, and other ephemera were the real meat of the grant papers. Hundreds of letters to and from constituents about governmental matters, big and small. They revealed much about Governor Graham as a man and a Senator. Um, not about him as a governor, because all those papers are up in Tallahassee already and part of um, uh, part of the documents up, up there. Um, but they revealed his decency, his thoroughness, and his respect for the people he represented. All things which come out in the op-ed pieces of this book. I finally got to meet him in person when Anna Henderson arranged for him to speak to my Florida history class a tradition that continued into David Colburn's tenure as director of the Graham Center and only ended with COVID. My students loved him coming to talk to their classes. A, because then they didn't have to listen to me for a lecture for one day. And B, how often do you get a two-term governor and three-term senator speak to you in a regular class setting? And every year he talked about something different, whatever he wanted to talk, you know, I didn't tell him what to talk about. He just talked about what he wanted to. But the best talk he gave is when he discussed his father, Ernest Cap Graham, a Florida state senator and dairy farmer from Dade County. Students were riveted as he explained how Cap sponsored legislation in 1937 to end the Florida poll tax and the political reasons for doing so. His yearly visits were one of the highlights of, of the class and also of my teaching career. So these two men, one, a respected teacher, author, college administrator, and director of the Graham Center, the other a towering figure in state and national politics, and the person for whom the eponymous center was named, decided to publish a book of their many newspaper pieces collected over the past 30 years. They ran this idea past Meredith Babb, then head of UPF, University Press of Florida, and she agreed that the press would publish the book. Well, who the hell wouldn't want to publish a book, a collection of essays written by these influential Florida notables? With a promise to publish, they began to choose choice pieces and organize them by topic. They were in the middle of this process when David died unexpectedly in September of 2019. I came on board and could see the direction of their organizational structure and the categories they developed, but had to grapple with the fact that the articles they chose were voluminous in number and all in non-digital form. Some original newspaper pages, some Xerox copies, many with no dates or newspaper attribution. A highlight of this process, receiving a box of these articles from David's daughter, Margaret, who's here today, uh, in the pouring rain. You know, just, after choosing the pieces I thought were the best from the many they had selected, reorganizing them through their categories and mine, and spending way too much time using newspapers.com to track down the articles which had no attribution, I was ready to get UF, uh, UPF fully involved with digitizing the articles to put them into publishable form. Now comes the hard part, trying to provide coherent connections between the articles and the sections, as well as writing an introduction to a book that would prove, provide context and nuance to the work of the two influential authors. This was made more difficult by the fact that I knew my parts of the broader work had to match the clarity, the depth, and passion exemplified by David and Governor Graham throughout their op-ed pieces. What really struck me about not only the pieces chosen for this book, but also the ones that we had to leave on the cutting room floor, and there's that analogy to, to Hollywood again, right, uh, was the consistency of both authors over time combined with their uncanny ability to change over time. Consistent, strong, persuasive writing from beginning to end and an ability to see things in the context of their time period make these pieces both easy to read and important to digest. These pieces are not the work of dedicated ideologues, but rather thoughtful commentaries on our current situation. Everywhere throughout these works, the reader, that's you guys, 
can find nuggets that speak to the world around us. Here's just one example from 2008 when Governor Graham wrote, democracy does not automatically renew itself in every generation. Wow, that could have and should have been written yesterday. The op-ed pieces in this book were penned during a time span of 28 years, from 1991 to 2019. Since both writers are Floridians, and most of the articles come from Florida newspapers, although not all of them, the vast majority of pieces speak to Florida topics, yet they examine issues that stretch far back past 1991 and speak to subjects that will affect Floridians, you and your grandchildren, far into the future. Chief among those issues is the racial divide in this state. Both David Colburn and Governor Graham are keenly aware of Florida's history of racial subordination and white supremacy, and are not shy about discussing the legacy of that past in relation to the present. The articles on this topic seem increasingly perceptive at, at a time when discussions on these themes are discouraged, disparaged, and even banned. Listen to David Colburn's word in an article for the Gainesville Sun in February 2014. Sounds like he could be speaking today. Sorry about the glasses. And I'm reading from the articles in the book. Just bear with me. The events, this is David's words, the events at Rosewood during the first week of January 1923 highlighted the pervasiveness and horrific consequences of racism in Florida. The entire black community was destroyed following an allegation of rape against a black man who was never identified. Several residents, several residents were also murdered by white mobs and others were driven from their property forever. Maybe I don't even need these damn things. In reflecting on these developments and subsequent life, one resident observed nothing was the same after Rosewood. In the case of St. Augustine, it was 30 years ago that the city found itself at the epicenter of the civil rights movement. In the spring of 1964, Dr. King and his fellow ministers joined forces with local civil rights activists to do battle with city and county leaders over the community's widespread segregation practices. Calling St. Augustine the oldest segregated city in America, King drew the national press to the city to cover the protests and recruited an army of supporters. Local white leaders fought King at every turn and worked closely together to defeat civil rights protesters. They also privately encouraged the violence perpetrated by white extremists against the demonstrators. As we celebrate Black History Month, because this was written in February, we need to remember that Florida's place in the nation prior to 1964 was circumscribed by racism and segregation policies that crippled its advancement and oppressed an entire race of people. It took the courageous actions of individuals in Rosewood and St. Augustine to expose this and to help secure the nation's democracy for all its people. Pretty amazing stuff. They also, Graham and Colburn, Examine the state's environmental woes. Way back in 2006, Governor Graham warned about the dangers of global warming and sea level rise. Let's see if I can find these pages more quickly here. And here's the words of Governor Graham. We must get serious about the impact of global warming and get on with the things that will blunt its effect. The major source, this is 2006, understand this. The major source of pollutants that add to the heat of this planet are our cars and trucks. America cannot wait another year to begin the process of moving towards a more energy conservative, less polluting and energy independent nation. Florida, with more at risk from global warming than any other state should be in the lead. 12 years later, David Colburn reiterated these ideas. Getting better at finding pages. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe. Okay. But contrasting other eras, today's growth pressures are spread throughout much more of the peninsula and are already amplified by climate change. This is 2018. Florida stands to lose more homes and more real estate value to sea rise than any state in the nation. Hurricane Michael underscored Florida's vulnerability to the weather extremes climate scientists predict will become more frequent, frequent with warming. These threats mean Florida's interior counties could see unprecedented growth as more coastal dwellers move inland. 
Growth, is, growth has been a litmus, litmus test for every modern Florida governor since the mid-1950s, when a nationwide drought crept down the peninsula, revealing the state's vulnerability to water, water shortages one year and hurricanes the next. By the late 1960s, political leaders inspired by Democratic Governor Ruben Askew and Republican conservative, uh, conservation leader Nathaniel Reed, there's that bipartisanship that Matt talked about, agreed that growth could not continue unplanned lest it ruin the fragile natural beauty that makes Florida, Florida, right? And Bob Graham tied the past to the present and to the future when in 2014, he talked about the degradation of Florida's iconic springs. And John Moran, if you're here still, um, this speaks to you, okay? So important to us right here in North Central Florida. Now let's come back to 2014. This is in the words of the governor. Florida has a population of more than 19 million and the problems facing our waters from the panhandle to the Keys have gotten worse. Many of Florida's iconic springs still do not have basic protection. Springs are dying from too little flow and too many nutrients. Rivers are covered in algae mats and estuaries and coastal waters are suffering staggering losses of marine life and birds. Now when our waters need strong environmental protection, the most, we no longer have them. My dear friend and predecessor, Governor Ruben Askew, gave the 1972 legislature the following piece of advice. And I would suggest that that advice needs to be taken by the current legislature. On the opening day session, his words are truer today than ever. Your own election, this is Governor Graham quoting Governor Askew. Your own elections are pressing down upon you, telling you to try and slip through this session as quickly and quietly as possible with as little action as possible. I ask you to do your best to put aside those thoughts and work instead to come up with real answers to our toughest problems today. And it begins with the environment, as indeed it must, if any of our other efforts are to have meaning for tomorrow. Though the book emphasizes Florida subjects, many of the last op-ed pieces deal with national issues focusing on U.S. foreign policy and the safety of all Americans. This represents the movement of Governor Graham from Florida governor to a member of the U.S. Senate, where he served, as Matt said, as chair of both the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Joint Congressional Investigation into Intelligence surrounding the attacks of 9-11. These last pieces give the book relevance to not only Floridians, but to all Americans interested in our nation's place in a changing and dangerous world. The governor is especially prescient regarding the nation's vulnerability to pandemics. In 2009, okay, just, just take that. He wrote this. The 2009 H1N1 swine flu epidemic should remind Americans of two important truths. Mother nature is full of surprises and preparation matters. No one doubts that new diseases will emerge and that they could be a health risk to many Americans and even a threat to national security. The scenarios are easy to anticipate. An entirely new virus could take the world by storm, as SARS nearly did in 2003. Treatment for old plagues could become ineffective as antibiotic resistance makes the drugs we have useless. This is a national security issue, just as important as the capability to produce world-class military hardware and technology. It's also a no, it's also a no regret investment. It goes without saying that the best medicine in the world will do not do any good if it doesn't reach the people who need them. Hospitals and public health systems have to be prepared to receive medicines and have the capability to deliver life-saving care. As John Kennedy said, the time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining. Now, before the next public health emergency, is the time to invest in our nation's public and uh, a nation's ability to respond to a public health emergency so that we'll have the tools we need to prevent, contain, and treat disease. These examples are but a few of the many gems that populate the book. Other sections focus on education and its value, gubernatorial leadership, and the growing importance of both of Florida in both region and, and nation. In my short introduction to each of the 12 sections of the book, I have placed these particular op-eds within the section in a broader historical and societal context. I'll read from just a couple of them. 
to just bore you even more. Okay, so this is from my introduction on Florida history. So and maybe the glasses actually do work. Maybe not. Maybe not. It's always seen that Florida doesn't have a history, that the state really started with Disney World. in 1971, or maybe with the population explosion in the 1950s after World War II, or taking a big stretch that it began with Henry Flagler's railroad reaching Miami in 1896. But regardless, Floridians tend to look more to the future than to the past, since so many of them have little connections to the state itself, as Matt talked about earlier. Yet, as Colburn and Graham pointedly explain, many of the vexing problems that plague this rather unimportant state in 1940 remain today and seem to be just as intractable. The authors presently examine issues of race and class, of the battle between economic development and protection of Florida's fragile and unique environment, and of the broad demographic shifts that have transformed the state, but not necessarily its political systems. Graham and Colburn write about these concerns in all their op-eds as they recognize the state's long and rather convoluted trajectory to get to where we are today. They also acknowledge that Florida's past, as hidden or irrelevant as it seems to most contemporary Floridians, is key to understanding both the state's present problems and its future possibilities. As David Coleman wrote in 1993 in an article that's not in the book, it is important that, quote, we acknowledge the state's past and those who have preceded us and recognize both their achievements and their failures. Each is essential in helping us to mature as a people and a state. Let's send that to Tallahassee right now, right? Okay. Um, and I'll read just one more um, on Florida and race, okay? Um, it's often been said that Florida is in the South, but not of the South. Nothing, however, could be further from the truth, and the articles in this section verify the fact that Florida's long history of problematic race relations places it squarely alongside Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. In January 19, 1861, Florida became the third state to secede from the Union, and it had the highest per capita lynching rate out of any state in the country. Between 2020 and 2025, which is where we are now, we mark the summer anniversaries of Florida's racial incidents that match anything that happened in other Southern states. Those include the centennial of both the Ocoee massacre and the destruction of Rosewood, the 75th anniversary of the Groveland Four case, the 70th anniversary of the still unsolved assassination of Harry T. Moore, and the 60th anniversary of the St. Augustine civil rights demonstrations. The pieces in this part of the book also remind us that while matters of race affect society at large, they also impact specific individuals in many cases and in many ways. The personal stories told here allow readers to understand just how important and invidious racial problems can be and how the efforts of ordinary Floridians can make a huge difference in bridging the racial divide. There are no simple answers given here, no magic cures or suggestions or, or options suggested. However, the articles tell readers that recognition of past evils is a necessary first step in confronting the racial problems Florida and the nation as a whole face today. The questions broached in this section underlie many of the concerns that are examined in other sections, particularly those examining politics and leadership. They recognize the insight of W.E.B. Du Bois in his seminal 1903 book, The Souls of Black Folk, when he wrote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. They also let us know that this problem has not yet been solved in the 21st. Like the manatee and the Florida panther, the newspaper op-ed is an endangered species, beset by declining newspaper circulation, by alternate forms of news dissemination like Twitter and podcasts, and by a generation of young people addicted to their smartphones, it may not live in its current form very much longer. In my larger introduction to the volume, I explain the history of this type of writing and how it became a crucial part of the democratic process in this country, as the op-ed form provides a focus on one thing, the importance of an informed, involved, and diverse citizenry. So, let me read a little bit from the introduction to the entire thing, and then we'll kind of wrap it up. In 2018, a historian 
with the interesting name of Geraldo Cadaver, <laughs> wrote that writing op-eds and seeing them through to publication takes time and emotional energy. There's only so many hours in a day to fill the tasks that complete, compete for our attention. Yet, David Colburn and Governor Graham kept writing op-eds for 28 years, month after month, year after year. Why? Because for them, the writing of op-eds mattered. As these articles provided, according to Cadaver, historical depth and complexity to the world in which we certainly, uh, which we currently live. If F. Cadaver argues a good op-ed always has tension, the works of Graham and Colburn fill that bill exactly. Their writing informs, elucidates, and challenges. The pieces in this book are the best of that work. They speak to our collective past, our problematic present, and a future filled with both her hope and concern. As David Colburn writes in 1996, the way Florida harmonizes this diversity, builds a sense of community and governs itself in the 21st century is what stimulates so much attention to this state. For as Florida goes in the 21st century, so many political observers believe will the nation. So things to think about. Another historian writes another article in 2020, a woman named Joanna Meyerowitz, and she's president of the uh, Association of American Historians. And she writes an article in uh, September 2020 entitled 180 Op-Eds, or How to Make the Present Historical. Um, this examined the relevance and power of the op-ed as a piece, a category of writing she calls short form history. Written for a broader non-historical readership, op-eds rely on, quote, carefully chosen shards of evidence, on the art of persuasion, and on the reader's trust in the author's expertise. Bob Graham and David Colburn are among the few op-ed writers who possess that rare combination of authorial expertise and readership trust. Meyerowitz, that Meyerowitz so admired. Their knowledge of both the American political process and the historical antecedents of contemporary hot button issues make their op-eds valuable, informative, and remarkably readable. She ends her essay by making a bold statement about the value of op-eds. The best of them, she proclaims, open, opens the space to imagine a different future. David Colburn and Governor Graham did that consistently with their articles as they speak not only about current issues and problems, but also about how they and us can help shape a future in a more positive direction. Among the greatest takeaways from writings by David and the governor is their plea for a more reasoned discourse in the public sphere and a greater emphasis on improving education at all levels. That includes the importance of teaching civic literacy in the public schools and in the post-secondary education. Governor Graham said it best when he wrote in 2008, quote, if we want future generations of Americans to sustain our democracy, we must educate them to be informed, skilled, and engaged citizens. Five years later, David Colburn attacked, quote, legislative mandates which originate in the premise that we cannot trust teachers to do the right thing. Instead, he argues, it would be wise and appropriate if policymakers started from a different place, one of trusting teachers. In these words, in these times, the words of both authors, authors resonate deeply. Governor Graham did not stop writing op-ed pieces with the development of this book. Even the pandemic could not prevent him from expressing his views about Florida and its promise and problems. Just a year ago, he published an op-ed piece in the Tampa Bay Times, authored in conjunction with his friend and fellow environmental activist, Jimmy Buffett. Written in reaction to the unprecedented number of manatee deaths in 2021, the governor concluded that, quote, the only way to remove, uh, to reverse the devastating consequences of too much nutrient pollution in our waterways is for citizens to demand that their local, state, and federal leaders make cleaning up those waterways a top mutual priority. Unless we stop the excess nutrient pollution from making its way into our bays, lagoons, and rivers, our state will not be fit for man or manatee alike. Let us hope that Governor Graham will continue to pen pieces like this so that in the future, we can have another volume like this one. So let me end with some words I wrote for the introduction. 
These articles show the broad range of interest that David, and here I'll call him Bob, that David and Bob showed in a wide variety of topics, from race relations to state and national politics, from environmental concerns to education, from foreign affairs to natural and human-made disasters. The contemporary, contemporaneous nature of the op-eds is striking. Articles written 10, 20, and even 30 years ago speak to issues that resonate today in today's news. Taken together, this collective body of work by two giants in their respective fields is a fitting coder fitting coda to their public lives. At a time like now, when learned temperate discourse, especially from our elected leaders, is in short supply, we can turn to the writings of David Colburn and Governor Bob Graham to show us the way to a better future. Thank you. I'll take questions or you guys can go and eat out in the back. Any questions? That's either a good sign or a very bad sign. I don't know what, the, I don't know what that is. No questions? Nicole, no questions? Oh, I got questions for later. You know. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Yes, ma'am. Of course not. Do I sound do, do I sound like do I sound like a Florida native? Well, when my parents are still alive, my wife could always tell when I was in the on the phone to them. I'm doing fine. How are you? Right. So, 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 so the answer is no. Yes, sir. Most prophetic. The question is, you know, looking back on those, what did I see most prophetic? I think the thing I saw most prophetic is the fact that um, issues regarding race have not really changed that much. Um, I think that that that's the thing. And and again, the continuous argument over education. You know, we're continuing to attempt to to um, figure out how to educate our children better, and it's always without input from the people who know the most of how to do it. So I think those two things more than anything else. Great question, certainly, yes. Yes, sir. Did the governor and David have an opinion on ranked choice voting and ways to solve the problem? On what? Ranked choice, ranked choice voting and then how you can solve current I, I think I think ranked choice voting, yeah. I think one article in here that the governor has is bring back the second primary. And I think you know that that's that's a, that's a really important way, and and certainly um, he would not have have been um, able to run again for governor without the second primary. So I think that yeah, they're looking for interesting ways to do it. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, you mentioned that it was both consistent and willing. Yeah. I think I think particularly David changed his mind particularly about race and the importance of it um he moves from being kind of a good liberal if you to being more of a person who much more is aware of the issues associated with african-american concerns um i think that that and i think certainly he also both of them also um move towards much more inclusive notion of the, the um, improvement of or the, the need for women to be involved much more um but i think the key is that their consistency allows them to change their consistency is always believing in the public and i think maybe the, the change is in, increasing the size of who that public is Caitlin. I have a question from Zoom. Did you see from Zoom? I, I wanted to ask so, so it can be from the ether up there, like the voice of God. Oh, okay. Um, did you see Frank Bernie's essay about public school isn't just for parents, but for all society, even childhood learners, and the system? What do you think? I think I think 
I would agree with that. I think that um, both David and the governor would agree with that. Um, at a time in which public schools are completely under attack, um, I think that they recognized, and I recognize as, as uh, someone who taught in the public schools, as the spouse of a public school teacher, as the, the uh, father-in-law of a public school teacher, um, that public schools matter, that they are key to a democracy. They are key to a, a, a um, literate and um, importantly uh, aware civic engagement. And without it, I think that that um, we will be in serious trouble. So I think that, yeah, public public schools are not, you know, parents don't own public schools, you know, public schools are owned by all of us, just like public libraries are owned by all of us. So I think that the key is that word public. Right? Fred, you can ask a question about basketball. <laughs> Yep, 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 I was wearing goggles then, yep. Uh, did they explicitly uh, say that they were going to be enforcing the Second Amendment rights of bipartisanship? Oh, I think that, that that runs through, that run, it's a thread that runs through all of them. Every, every article that they have, they talk about the need for people to find common ground. Um, people even who are fundamentally divergent in their political beliefs, that the common ground is the basis of America. And yeah, I think, I think that David certainly would be aghast at what's going on. And I know the governor is at, at, at the, the, the partisan divide that, that is taking place in this country. And I think that, you know, trying to, to get past it is a way is, is certainly one of the themes of this book, um, that people can disagree, but yet agree on the fundamental basis of what it means to be an American. So yeah, for sure. And hopefully, I mean, I tried to bring that out in, you know, the introduction and in the introduction to many of the, especially the article, the one on Florida, um, on Florida politics and on gubernatorial leadership, you know, and, that, and you can see, you know, the, 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 um, the quote from, uh, from ask you about the need for that bipartisanship. Yeah. Yes. Leave that power, leave the power, and be able to walk away from it. I sort of feel very unempowered in the space to participate in democracy. And I was just wondering what did they have to say about what individuals regain power? That seems to be more concentrated. Well, I think they they decry the rise of, of corporate power and influence. I think that they, within, within most of their articles, they talk about the power of, of citizen activism, um, especially, and you can see on, on the wall here, that activism led by people like um, Marjorie Harris Carr, um, that, and, and, you know, I think her story, and, and for those of you who don't know, Marjorie Harris Carr stopped the Cross Florida Barge Canal, and there's the book that talks about it. Thank you, Michael. It's one, one of my students. Um, um, you know, she basically a ragtag group of citizen activists, right? Um, and at, at this point in the in the mid 1960s. The state of Florida at all levels, the federal government at all levels was bound and determined to get this thing through. And, you know, they stopped it. Same thing, um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and her allies stopped this, you know, almost, you know, completely acceptable thing of building a new airport in the middle of the Everglades for Miami. No one thought either of those people had a chance. And you know, understand that these are women leading these movements at a time when women were not expected to be in those positions. Um, so I think the, the key is hope, you know, and, and I hate to be that, that kind of optimistic in these times of saying, you know, there's Obama said, keep hope alive. But, you know, no one would have given odds now you can bet in Florida, so no one would have given odds that either of those two, those two women would have been able to stop those two incredibly large projects in the midst of, you know, support from everybody and government funding. So I think I think the fact that organization matters, that knowledge matters, and that not being not giving up matters. 
And, you know, and, and I think both authors speak to that. And, 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 you know, certainly how long did it take for justice or some form of justice to take place with Rosewood? You know, generations, right? So, I, you know, the arc of justice bends, the, the arc of life bends towards justice. So, um, you know, it takes a while. And at this time, it doesn't look like it's bending at all. So, yes, sir. You guys don't want to eat, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, Michael, how are another basketball player? Yes, yeah. um, Airball. <laughs> Uh huh. And in particular, it's my understanding that set, a, set aside a million dollars of state funds to be expended. Uh, what was Graham's position on using state funds to defend uh, a partisan uh, effort? Uh, I can't speak for the governor, but I'm sure he would be appalled. You know, I'm sure he would be appalled. I mean, you know, this is this is using money that's all of ours to defend a partisan thing. So I, you know, I, 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 I speak for him, but I cannot speak for him, but I speak for him and say he would be shocked. <laughs> and and, and you know, I, it's, it's an absurdity, but along with everything else, so. Caitlin. Uh, one more for the ether, and I think this is a good one to end on. Um, this is kind of related to the Rosewood Institute, but what would you describe the fundamental American values that we should be able to um, the fact that um, everyone has a right to vote, the fact that everyone has a right to clean water and clean air, that everyone has a right to a, uh, a good and appropriate public education, and that everyone has a right to um, have their voice heard. Well, thank you. Um, there's stuff out in the back. There's books for sale that I can sign, and there's lots of food, dessert, including Florida-made cookies, and um, wine and beer, as well as other soft drinks. Thank you for coming. Keep the faith. Much appreciated. Thank you to the Matheson for hosting.